Yep, there we go. Yep. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, I just want to pick off on the uh, subject you talked about uh, the other day with supply chains. And I yep. wanted to uh, take it a step further uh, in terms of talking about inflation because it has major infl inflation implications. Uh, so the classic example of inflation is uh, too much money chasing too few goods, correct? Yep. yep. All right. So in, in this in this circumstance with these supply chains, we're getting it from the other end. Not only do we have too much ch money chasing too few goods, now we got too few goods, even fewer goods, right? Because A, they're not getting there uh, because of transportation issues, labor shortages. Now we also have input costs, such as oil going through the roof. So there's all these factors uh, uh, and all the misallocations you talked about. I listened to uh, your talk yeah. in terms of uh, COVID uh, uh, misallocations of essentials versus non-essential, um, you know, the constraints. Uh, so what I'm trying to get at, what I'm trying to figure, I'm trying to figure out, is this going to be inflation? Like, this sounds like it's going to be inflation on steroids. It's like, it's like a different type of inflation. It's not like, I mean, I'm looking at the history of inflationary periods, the Weimar Republic, then the 1970s when we, when we got to 20%, hyperinflation in Argentina. So, I mean, I'm trying to understand this particular type, the particular type of circumstances we have, which you talked about, and the implications, uh, because we're getting it from both ends. Not only are we getting it from the money supply, we're getting it from the other end in terms of Goods are not getting to market, and goods uh, input costs of goods are going through the roof. The real question is, uh, prices could go up, but the real question is, is it permanent? Is it uh, is the inflation sustainable? So let's say, um, I don't know, something happens, the, the supply chains are broken, uh, there are too few goods, people are demanding them, so there's... Uh, they're bidding the prices up, so prices go up. But then as soon as the goods come in, right, as soon as the supply chains are fixed, prices will drop, right? Prices will adjust back down because now, uh, you, you know, there's, there's more supply and therefore supply and demand will meet and, 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 and uh, prices, prices will therefore come down. That's what's meant by when the, when the Biden administration, where many economists say, they expect this inflation to be transitory. That is, that it is only going to be uh, as a consequence of the shock to the system, that it's not sustainable, that it won't um, uh, keep going, right? N now, even if it's transient, what does transient mean? Does that mean a few months? Does that mean a few years? Does that mean, does it go up to 15% and then come down? Does it go up to 4% and then come down if we peaked? Um, there is a ton of questions associated with what the what is going on right now in the economy. There's a ton of questions associated with whether we're going to have inflation, how big of an inflation it's going to be, and for how long. I've been trying to figure this out, and I don't have an answer. Well, is um, there a historical is there a historical precedent uh, in terms of past? You know, I gave you the five examples, the Weimar Republic, the, uh, the, the inflation of the 70s, the Argentinian Harper inflation. Is there anything that mimics There's certainly the similarities today? today? There's certainly similarities to the 1970s, but the 1970s, are, you know, there, there, there are also things that are different about the 1970s. There is a big controversy about how much money has actually been created by the Fed, whether there is a lot of money circulating or whether there isn't. Um, certain money uh, measures uh, are not have not spiked, uh, but M3, for example, has. Is M3 the right number? Are other M, M numbers the right number? Uh, look, uh, in a sense, the whole field of inflation and, and the, the measures of money and control of money, uh, we've only been doing this for about 50 years uh, in, in the current form with a, with a sophisticated global financial market. Uh, that is since, uh, since uh, 1971, when we went off uh, Bretton Woods. And I, I think the economic knowledge is not quite there. If you look at financial markets, 
who are pretty smart people, right? They don't think there's inflation. Um, uh, the, 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 the inflation premium on inflation adjusted bonds it pegs long term, long run inflation, long run being the next few years at two point something. It doesn't peg it very high. Now, markets can be wrong. Mar markets are often wrong. Indeed, with regard to inflation, markets are often wrong. Uh, you know, somebody like Peter Schiff thinks we're, we're heading towards hyperinflation tomorrow. Um, you know, th this wouldn't be the first time that many economists, uh, particularly uh, libertarian economists, think we're heading towards hyperinflation tomorrow. So, you know, my answer is the one that is least media friendly. I don't know. I don't know. It, it, you know, um, the world is screwed up. The monetary system screwed up. We've got screwed up supply chains. We've got mismatches with regard to supply and demand. How that exactly uh, manifests itself in prices over the long run, because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about price inflation, not monetary inflation. We don't even have a good measure of monetary inflation. We don't know how to measure it. Um, I don't know, and I don't think, and I, and I, now long term, we're going to have to have inflation because the government can't keep up with the debt. But is that now? Is that in five years? Is that, you know, in 10 years? I, you know, I don't know. It could be tomorrow. It could be now. This could be the big one. This could be the, the, the complete collapse of the dollar. I don't think so, but it could be, you know, and, 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 it, you know, uh, these, these supply chain issues are not going to permanently raise prices because the supply chain issues are not permanent. The ships are out there, they, they haven't sunk. Um, they're just not being efficiently, um, yeah, but, but they're coming from everywhere. We got ship shortages. So used cars are going not ship short. There are no ship shortages. Chips, there are no chips, ship shortages. Chips. No, okay. no, 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 no. Chips, chips, computer oh. chips. But again, this is all an aspect of the distortions that happened uh, during COVID. The chip shortages will be fixed at some point. And at that point, you know, uh, at that point, prices of chips will come down. And so will all the things that use chips. What yes, about input but, costs, like oil and copper? Well, hold on, because there are 20 miles of ships with an yep. S at the beginning yep. uh, waiting to be unloaded around the port of Los Angeles. Yes. And the reason for this is that one of Trump's attempts to get people to buy American was to institute uh, a host of regulations against unloading imports in American ports. And those regulations have not gone away, uh, widened somehow. I don't know whether it's the influence of the unions, whether um, there Biden has always been. Play. The Democrats uh, are not pro free trade, but look, all those all those things exist. Um, but that is not the problem right now. The problem is not import restrictions. Those exist. They're going to make it. They're going to make prices in the U.S. higher, not for monetary inflation reasons, but just because uh, when you when you tax American people and goods, and when you make it more difficult to transport them, and when you create barriers to entry. That happens. The, 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 the long trail of ships outside of Los Angeles is almost directly related to COVID and to the restrictions and lockdowns and, and mask regulations and all that. It, it's not only in the U.S. Other countries have the same kind of um, backlogs of, of uh, incoming and outgoing ships. Uh, containers are in the wrong places because there was a shortage of, dry, of truck drivers during COVID because they wouldn't go out and drive, so they didn't move the containers to the right places. Uh, there's just a mess created by government policy during COVID that is going to take probably a year or two to clear. And while Trump's tariffs and Trump's all the tr stuff the Trump administration did is a barrier to speeding that up, it is not something that the market can't, you know, the market will adjust and prices will be higher and, you know, that's it. And, and our standard of living will be marginally lower 
but the supply chain won't be hurt. The supply chain will continue to function. It'll just continue to function at whatever level these new prices will dictate. That what we're seeing right now in the oil shortages, oil shortages are primarily a, a product of, again, policy under, uh, uh, under uh, European primarily administrations. There's no shortage of gas or, uh, in the United States. The shortages are all in Europe. Um, and uh, the, 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 the reason there's a shortage is regulation in the United States not to export gas. So we can't relieve the shortages overseas even though we have a surplus because we're not allowed to, or the big restrictions on export. Um, and in addition, which, which the Trump administration supported these restrictions, um, but there's also, uh, it has to do with the fact that uh, uh, OPEC is not increasing supply. It has to do with the fact that pipelines were never built. It has to do with the fact that Germany went off of nuclear. It has to do with the fact that Britain uh, has invested gazillions of dollars in windmills in the North Sea and the wind, the wind is not blowing when they want it to blow when they need electricity. It only blows when it blows. Um, the fact that in Germany and in the UK, they've invested heavily in solar panels. If anybody's ever been to the UK and Germany knows that the sun never literally shines in these places, ever. <laughs> you know, except for one week in, you know, last month when I was actually in London and the sun shined. Um, I mean, these are policy mistakes. It has to do with the conflict with Russia and not enough gas, and the fact that Russia doesn't want to pump all this gas voluntarily. They don't mind Europe having a, a, a crisis right now. And it's just mind-boggling. It's, it's, it's going to be a very cold winter. Well, unless, unless suddenly, and I wouldn't be surprised at all if this happens, they discover that, oh, this was all exaggerated and there's actually plenty of natural gas, which I wouldn't be surprised because our media and everybody else tends to exaggerate these things and tell, tends to turn everything into a catastrophe. Uh, and if you look at the U.S., the U.S. is not pumping any additional natural gas because the, the natural gas companies don't have an incentive to do it. If they do, they'll be accused of taking advantage of a crisis and of uh, polluting the air. And they'd rather sit in their reserves and wait their time and bide their time. Um, uh, you know, prices are going up. You'd think there'd be more drilling. There isn't much, again, because uh, uh, people like BlackRock won't provide capital uh, to drill more oil because it's anti-ESG and it's not socially responsible to actually drill for oil. So you've got all these things overlaid one on top of the other, all happening at once, which are resulting in major global uh, shortfalls. And it's a problem. And of course, the whole world is, ent I think, entering a period of slow to no economic growth. We just saw e in numbers out of China where the economic growth is very is is way lower than it has been historically in China, and if you this is if you believe the Chinese numbers, generally China is doing everything in its power to slow economic growth, and it might be on purpose because they they might want to spend some time redistributing wealth because they've decided that they want more wealth equality rather than allowing for wealth creation. Who knows what's going on in those crazy dictators' minds? Um, but all I can, all we can say is. We're heading towards real economic turbulence. We're heading towards really economic bad times. Um, there's the, the gold price is not indicating superinflation. Gold is not going through the roof right now. Um, if you believe the Bitcoiners, then Bitcoin is the ultimate hedge against inflation. It is going up. So maybe, maybe that's the inflationary sign. I don't know. I don't get it. Um, but I think all we can say right now is the world's in a mess economic growth is, is going to be constrained. Uh, prices are probably going up in the short run, hard to tell what's gonna happen in the long run. And uh, you know, wages are also going up. So most of the American people will not see a decline in the standard of living because wages are going up because the fact is there's a job shortage, unions are emboldened, unions are going on strike, not because of the Biden administration, but because there's a labor shortage. So unions feel like they have upper hand in terms of uh, bargaining power. Caterpillar, the uh, American, what's the labor union that does auto? Uh, this is the first strike in like 35 years uh, at the Caterpillar plants. Uh, that's because they feel emboldened by the shortage of labor. That is a direct result of, of, of Trump's and now Biden's restrictions on immigration. The fact that there are not enough immigrants coming in, we've got massive shortage of labor across the entire country. 
uh, particularly in construction, but across all these industries. And women in economic mess, but that shouldn't surprise anybody uh, that we're in economic mess. Uh, the UK did Brexit. They got all excited about Brexit. This is great. We'll set our own economic policy. They got a free trade deal with Canada, New Zealand, and Australia. And they said, great. We are now an uh, independent free trade island. They didn't cut a free trade deal with anybody else. They didn't lower tariffs to zero, as I recommended. And then all the regulations that they considered a burden from the European Union, they've imposed on themselves, right? So they just they just took all the regulations of the European Union they imposed on. And then the conservative, the conservative government of, of the UK uh, wants to be more aggressive than the EU in achieving carbon neutrality, whatever the hell that means. I guess death for everybody is what it means. Um, so they are building more windmills in the North Sea to provide even less electricity. Um, the world's insane. I mean, and, and the European Union, I mean, is, is a complete and utter disaster. The only country in good shape in the European Union, as, as uh, strikingly um, nutty as that may be, is France, because France produces 70 to 80 percent of its electricity from nuclear power. And it is exporting power to the UK. That's how that's how nutty the world is that, 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 that you know, uh, it goes under the under the channel and, and the UK is getting nuclear power from France. Um, but it's a mess. It's a mess. But to I think one of the things that I've learned over many, many years of trying to do this is that macroeconomic prediction is a fool's game. Uh, now, maybe somebody out there is good at it, but I haven't met them. Um, you know, if you cry wolf every year, sometimes you'll be right. If, you, if you're an optimist every single year, mostly you'll be right. That's the amazing thing, right? If, if you actually think that the stock market's going to go up every year and technology is going to be better and human life is going to be better, almost always you're right because the stock market almost never goes down. That's a reality. Um, so, I, you know, we'll have a day of reckoning. I don't know how long it'll be. I don't know when it's going to be. It will happen. Stock markets will go down. Economic disasters will happen. But I'm not. I'm not going to. I'm not going to predict it. <laughs> and same with inflation. I, I, I'm reading economists I really admire across the, the spectrum of kind of free market economists. Some are predicting 15% inflation by the end of the year, by the end of this year. Others are saying, "Now nah, the the money supply is actually hasn't increased that much. Maybe we'll get a small spike." But the Fed is actually doing a decent job. At, at, at increasing the money supply in, in accordance with demand for money. Um, and I see everything in between. And, and then you've got people like, you know, people who say, it's not going to just be 15%. The dollar is going to be collapse. And the whole world is going to abandon the dollar as the, as, as the standard. And, and uh, you know, the era of the dollar is over. I don't, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. But in the spectrum of zero to 15%, I doubt 15%, I doubt zero, but I don't know where inflation is going to be and how long it's going to last. And I'm an economist and I still don't know. So, you know, I'm you know this, is an evolving, this is an evolving situation, but if you have any thoughts as this thing evolves with the, uh, I, you I know, now let, that we've covered the supply chain, let us... Uh, Absolutely. I, I intend to update you on the state uh, on the state of these things as they happen and try to figure out from, you know, try to figure out if there's an economist out there. You know, uh, uh, John Cochran, who I have a huge amount of respect for and is seems to be always level minded and really, really rational about these things and not. I mean, he believes we're heading at some point towards towards uh, 70s like inflation. He believes that the government right now is behaving like the 70s government did. Uh, that the Fed is behaving very similar to the government. So, you know, that's John Cochran. I, I, I really respect him and buy him. You know, and if you think about the 70s, a lot, you know, the inflation began, but then the real kicker was the oil crisis of 73. The oil crisis of 73 didn't cause inflation, but it kind of accelerated trends that were already doing it. We've got a kind of crisis right now. The supply chain might be it. Things that trigger inflation expectations um, could really change things. And, and of course, uh, markets didn't expect inflation back then either, and yet we got it. That's another thing John Cochran always says. Bond markets never anticipated. It's always a surprise. 
Inflation always surprises people. And it's a surprise because it's exposed, it's easy to see. But while you're living it, it's very difficult to identify the causes and the, and the chain reaction that brings it about. I have thought we've had ridiculously low interest rates for 20, for 30 years, basically. Luckily, I didn't invest based on those that thought, because if I had, I would have lost my shirt, right? I, I wanted to short bonds in the mid-90s. God, talk about a bad trade. All right, Daniel, who knows about trading, yeah. Thank you for listening or watching the Iran Brooks Show. If you'd like to support the show, we make it as easy as possible for you to trade with me. You get value from listening. You get value from watching. Show your appreciation. You can do that by going to iranbookshow.com slash support, by going to Patreon, subscribe star, locals, and just making a appropriate contribution uh, on any one, of those, uh, any one of those channels. Also, if you'd like to see the Iran Book Show grow, please consider sharing our content and, of course, subscribe. Press that little bell button right down there on YouTube so that you get an announcement when we go live. And for you, those of you who are already subscribers and those of you who are already supporters of the show, thank you. I very much appreciate it.